Chapter 12 of Deliver Me from Ava by Paul Bailey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker. Chapter 12 It was a tense moment before either of us could speak. What time did you return from your father's house? I finally managed to ask. About 5.30. You told me this afternoon that Osman would return with you. He did. Then he died at Thalamus? Yes, in my study, on my treatment table. What time, Ava? Exactly at six o'clock. I stepped from her, walked to the study door, and peered in. The padded table was bare. I recalled, too, that but a few minutes before I had walked through that room, and certainly no corpse had I seen. Where is he? Castleman has taken the body. It is of no consequence now that Osman has been released. Castleman will properly dispose of it. You mean you'll not call an undertaker? Certainly not. Castleman will dispose of it. My legal mind could scarcely believe what my wife was saying. Don't you know there's a law about such things? I protested. Don't you know the authorities must be notified? A murder has been committed. Margot was beside Ava now. I could see she was on the defensive. No murder's been committed, she declared. And the only law that operates here is cosmic law, Ava quickly added. Openly disgusted, I stepped to Ava's boudoir telephone. I lifted it from its cradle, reached for the dial. A click sounded in my ear, and the line went dead. I tried for the call, but apparently the doctor controlled the telephone as he controlled every other thing in his court. Savagely, I bounced the phone back to its hook. If it wasn't a murder, please explain it. With a sigh, Ava dropped to one of the room's gay chairs. Abruptly, Margot turned and walked out the door. Osman was evidencing a decided reaction from his session when I arrived for my own. The physical weakness he displayed, you understand, is really of no consequence. He was properly exhilarated mentally, and that is the important thing. Of course, I replied and sniffed disgustedly. A humble attitude would be a good deal more becoming to you, Mark. An understanding mind seldom scoffs. You seem to forget that I've passed through the phase Osman was experiencing, and without dire results. Go ahead. When we returned, I suggested he lie down on the table for a little restful manipulation. It was while I was calling Margot he expired. And how does Margot feel about this affair? I watched Ava's face for the telltale flush, but there was none. Naturally, Margot was deeply shaken by the suddenness of Osman's release. Ava replied, and don't expect me to show surprise or suffer any betraying emotions. You know she is my mother. Of that I am fully aware. I knew the moment Margot confessed it to you, and I am content this should be so. Our sorrow in Osmond's release is not so greatly occasioned by his sudden absence from us as from the complete cessation of the tangent he had set his heart to explore. The psychic plane in which Osmond now finds himself, you must understand, is very close to us. Soon I shall walk and talk with him again, Margot likewise, when the ban is lifted. But someone here must take up his work. Don't look at me, I said, pocketing hands and mentally squirming like a speared frog. I'm beginning to think the whole damned bunch of you are unnatural monsters without normal feeling or affection. I know you're not guilty of murder, Ava, but I think your father is, along with sundry other crimes. Last night he nearly had me on the hook. Tonight I'm free, and a man with a duty. In ten minutes I'll be on my way to Pasadena, and in an hour this cuckoo nest is going to be examined by the law. I walked to her, and with infinite tenderness squeezed her hand. Goodbye, Ava, I said. Her eyes peered solemnly and hungrily up at me. It's no use, Mark, she cautioned. You'll never get out. You think you're not on the hook, but you are. I loathed the awesome and terrifying things to which this woman and her family paid homage, I loathed the unnamed crimes already perpetrated to whatever foul gods they served. But try as I might, I could stir no such morbid dislike for the woman I had married. I thought of the bliss moments enjoyed with her as the companion of my love. I thought of the smiles, the tender gestures, the trysted holy things which had been our life together thus far. And now she sat like a crowned goddess of beauty, terrible and wonderful. For Ava alone I would have surrendered. For Ava alone I would have sizzled in hell. 
that the revolting premise against which I had fought and the true target of my loathing was in that hour personified by her wicked father. So long as that ghoul were free to act, this woman could never be mine. So long as his power wielded itself unchallenged, no human in its darksome shadow could be safe. I stared at Ava in final desperation. My heartache melted into tears. I took both her slim, soft hands in mine and smiled to her the love that was destroying me. Darling, I said, I'll return. Mournfully, she shook her head. Of that, I am certain. Why do you speak such strange riddles? I speak of that which I know. There is no escape from you, except by conformance. But I shall not conform. You must not ask it. You're one of us, Mark. There is no turning back. Implanted in the very wellspring of your intelligence is the suggestive measure that will undo you the moment you endeavor to step out of the circle of influence. Your own subconscious, the very root of your behavior, affirmed that to my father last night. Doubtless you'll attempt to flee, but you'll not go far. I bravely strove to treat all of it with facetious contempt. If that's a threat, I laughed, it comes from the prettiest lips that could utter it. Goodbye, Ava, my dearest. I hauled her to my arms and crushed her in passion's embrace. Goodbye, I whispered throatily. She was crying as I lowered her again to the chair, and I was crying too. Without pausing to change from dinner clothes, without bothering to don hat or top coat, I strode through Ava's study, on into the big reception hall which tonight was but dimly lighted. The small dining room, its table immaculately spread for our abortive party, was bright and ready on my right. I did not pause. A moment later I was flying at top speed down the front steps of Thalamus, across the flagstoned court, and out the driveway into the darkness. My one overwhelming desire was to put distance behind me. Words cannot describe the terrifying load of worry and gloom which waited in upon me as I walked that black road toward freedom. The doctor was a murderer, of the most malignant and devilish sort. Oddity of his physical aspects, the grotesque and devious nature of his thinking, marked him beyond the kin of any parallel to my recollection. In my younger days, as an ambitious trial lawyer, I had met the usual run of killers daily cluttering the American courts, slayers for greed, passion, and revenge, mostly pathetic, cowering, and bedeviled humans, amazed at finding themselves at odds with the law. Dr. Craner matched nothing in my memory's dossier. The doctor was clever, intellectual, and undeniably brilliant. And knowing the maze of loopholes through which criminals endlessly crawl to freedom, I realized the difficulty, if not impossibility, of ever bringing the earless dwarf to trial on the direct charge of murdering his own son. A host of legal outs favored him, and with his money, a verdict of accidental death and an easily quashed charge of medical malpractice would doubtless send him back to the cradle of light a free man. But it was Ava and her deliverance that was sending me on my vengeance errand through this dark night. I wanted her, and I wanted her free and unfettered of any entanglements with the doctor's perversive power. That Craner wielded such a power only an idiot could doubt. I knew of it, and personally had felt its influence. As God lived, I would fight for its destruction. If killing that grotesque devil was the price for claiming what was rightfully mine, I'd do that too, without hesitation or conscience. But now in this hour was my chance to honorably best the demon. Once through the gates of these dark acres, and I'd have squad men on the premises within the hour. Yet with all my brave resolutions, the warnings of mother and daughter dinned in my ears. Their faith in the doctor's Kabbalistic alliances was unwavering and unassailable. As for me, my entire background of training and experience cried out against such mouthings. No intelligent man could accept them as anything short of medieval throwbacks and sheer idiocy. To attach credence to such trivia was to put education, enlightenment, and common sense to the lie. And yet... To say that logic and reason were rescuing me in strength would have been a gross untruth. I was uneasy, sensitive to every sound, and very definitely frightened of the night. Perhaps it was the sick, sweet odor of jasmine that lay in heavy fog about me. Perhaps it was the eerie flutings of the mocking birds, the mesmeric dirge of the crickets, or the crackle of my feet on the fresh asphalt. Such a foreboding sense of gloom as I possessed could have had its stirrings in the events of the day the rustle of the creatures of the night alongside my trail. 
or my own sense of inadequacy. Certain it was that every outward step from Thalamus increased alarmingly my burden of gloom. I argued against my fears. I speeded my steps. The bold grasp for my control made by the doctor last night was the greatest single source of my trepidation. I could scoff at his wriggling of my skull plates, if not at the entire seance, were it not for the hypnotic qualities he had so cleverly interjected. The ceiling light, his insistence on the unnatural lifting of my eyes for its viewance, the movements of his big hands, all were professional tricks of the hypnotist. My awakening had come amidst a series of forceful suggestions from the doctor concerning my reconciliation with the craners, thalamus, and a new and fresh desire to remain their contented neophyte. The alarming point was that Craner's suggestions had worked. I had stepped from his table a different man. My heart pounded with new fright, and my steps lagged at the calamitous implication of the thing. Had my own subconscious controlling factors of mind and body already assented to virtual prisonship of this man and his family? And why had everyone been so emphatically certain I would never leave the unguarded acres of the Craners? At a certain point in this dark road would I find myself deliberately and against my every conscious desire, swinging on my heel and stalking back to Thalamus? It was preposterous. It was idiotic even to think of such a thing. Every reasoning faculty told me such could not be. And yet I found myself halting in my tracks and bristling with fright. The jasmine was there. The accursed, mocking birds. The oppressive, crushing darkness. Ahead was the juncture of the road, a joining point of the branch over which I had come to Thalamus, the other branch coursing through dark woods to the cradle of light and the third fork leading straight ahead to the outer gates in freedom. Nervously I glanced behind me. I strained ears to the black night's every sound. I honestly believed if I could safely pass the road's fork, freedom would be mine. My last remembrance was my cautious walk toward it. When I awoke I was staring up at the skylights to the doctor's great room. The blue light was there. He was kneading at my head. End of chapter 12